previous videos, we've examined a range of different systemic vulnerabilities of the DPRK state. And we've seen that the COVID pandemic and its associated economic and food shock has placed North Korea in its most precarious position since the arduous march. But what happens next? What can we say about where this trajectory might be headed? Now, despite my provocative and sexy title for this video, Could the North Korean State Collapse? This question is more complex than it might first appear. While states do sometimes fail and collapse from time to time, there isn't a linear pathway from state fragility to state collapse. And the North Korean case is a good illustration of why we need to tread carefully when analysing how systemic change might unfold. So a brief outline of this video. I'll start by differentiating between making predictions and scenario mapping. Then we'll dive into some scenarios. So we'll look at state failure and collapse, managed systemic reform, popular uprising and revolution, elite coup d'etat, and externally imposed regime change. And then I'll finish off by asking why the future of the North Korean state matters to regional countries. Making predictions in IR is a fraught exercise. So for example, most expert analysts did not foresee the collapse of the USSR in the 1980s. Similarly, many experts, including some of the same people, predicted that North Korea would rapidly collapse in the 1990s, based on the recent collapse experience of the USSR that they originally didn't see coming. Most notable in the academic literature was the many writings of the American scholar Nicholas Eberstadt. In his article, Hastening North Korean Reunification, and the associated book, The End of North Korea, he argued that the Kim regime could not last under the stress of the famine and the rapid deterioration of the economy. A 1998 CIA report, which has since been made public through Freedom of Information, makes a similar kind of claim. And I quote here, the prospects remain strong that the Kim regime's refusal to reverse course in favor of major reform could generate some catalyst that will lead to its collapse, unquote. Similarly, Kim Kyung-won made a similar argument in his article, No Way Out, North Korea's Impending Collapse, warning that the economic fundamentals couldn't be ignored and that the Kim regime's collapse was imminent. And even in 2005, Kim doubled down on his prediction in his article, Downfall Delayed, despite evidence of North Korea's stuttering economic recovery from the famine. All of these scholars and many more got their predictions of North Korea's rapid collapse spectacularly wrong. And they're a cautionary tale that predictions are the graveyard of North Korea scholars. But we can understand how analysts came to this position during the 1990s. When we see events unfolding like the arduous march, it's natural to tend to assume the worst and imagine an inevitable cascade to collapse. In part, these collapsist analysts were blinded by their own bias. So remember, in the 1990s, this was the period of the end of history. This is the era in which US foreign policy elites were basking in the glow of their unipolar moment at, after the end of the Cold War. And many of these people assumed, understandably in that moment, but wrongly, that Northeast Asia would go down the same path as Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Another faulty assumption they made was to think that North Korea's only options were either full free market economic reform or full-blown state collapse. They couldn't conceive of other adaptation options that were open to Kim Jong-il at this time, and they certainly didn't bank on the resilience of the Songun politics model. So what this highlights is the danger of confirmation bias, of being blinded by one's own baggage and assumptions. And this is why we've critically reflected on our own positionality as North Korea analysts to help us avoid making similar errors of assumption. The caution about avoiding making concrete predictions doesn't mean that we can't hypothesize about the future of the DPRK, 
After all, strategic analysts have to account for worst case scenarios. That's part of the job of being a strategic analyst. But the trick is to understand a full range of potential scenarios without automatically following a linear path to the worst case. So a more sound way to go about this is to start, first of all, by accounting for our own potential biases as observers. Then we identify the complex political, economic and social trends that are in play in our case under analysis. And from there, we can assign probabilities and risk for each scenario based on that evidence base. But we never say precisely that this case, this scenario is going to happen. We have to be more nuanced because IR is too complex. There's too many variables to make definitive concrete predictions. So in that vein, what I present to you through the remainder of this video is a scenario map of different possibilities for systemic change in the DPRK. Let's start with the state failure and regime collapse scenario because of its prominence in the scholarly literature in the 1990s. But first, we need some definitions. And here I'm going to draw on the book, International Relations, Key Concepts by Griffiths et al. So a failed state is defined as a state that's no longer able to maintain itself as a viable political and economic unit. It's a state that's become essentially ungovernable and lacks legitimacy in the eyes of the international community. To understand the precise character of a failed state, it's worth contrasting a failed state with a successful or viable state that can maintain control of its borders, that can provide a decent level of services like health and education for its people, that does have functioning infrastructure and a strong economy, and is capable of maintaining law and order. So that kind of state is socially cohesive, and it follows then that it has a stable domestic political order. Now, for its part, North Korea is not, nor has it ever been, a failed state. However, it does suffer from some of the weaknesses that contribute to state failure. So it could be more accurately called a fragile state. The OECD defines fragile states as having weak capacity to carry out the basic functions of a state, including the governance of their population and territory. Fragile states struggle with fulfilling a basic social contract, and in not fulfilling its obligations to its citizens, the bonds of trust between people and their government become weak. Authority in these states is often centralised around a ruling clique, with limited opportunities for broad-based political participation. So there's a legitimacy gap. And in that gap, strong repressive institutions are used to maintain the authority of the state over its people. Most importantly, fragile states are also more vulnerable to internal and external shocks, along with the effects of climate change, natural disasters, and international economic crises. So in short, Fragile states are not resilient, and there's always a risk of state failure and a cascade or insecurity spiral to state collapse. We know from previous videos that North Korea ticks all of these boxes. The graphic shown here is of the 2021 Fragile States Index, which is published and updated annually by the NGO, the Fund for Peace. And if you've got a spare moment, do go to the Fragile States Index website and check out the listing for North Korea because it's got detailed information across 12 different indicators which justifies its ranking. Now, as you can see here on the map, North Korea is at the warning level for state fragility, but it's relatively resilient in comparison to some of the states at the alert level, the ones that are colored dark red here. A fragile state doesn't fail due to any one cause in particular. It's always usually the result of an extended process of state decay. And there's always many different forces at play in decay, working across long, medium and short term time horizons. So let's consider how these different forces come together. In an article in the journal Third World Quarterly, the Canadian scholar David Carmen argued that state failure is a non-linear process of relative decay, 
and that these processes of decay reinforce each other at macro, intermediate and micro levels. So this idea is built on a complex systems understanding of politics and governance, where we see the state not as a set of discrete and separate institutions, but as an integrated whole where all the parts of the political system, the economy and the society exist together in complex interrelationship. At the macro level, long-term processes of systemic transformation gradually lead to the emergence of state fragility. For North Korea, these macro level fragilities included economic inefficiencies related to the command system, its overly ideological approach to policy and problem solving, its unrepresentative political system and permanent food insecurity. At the intermediate level, state decay is related to the viability of state institutions. And we saw this in North Korea during the arduous march, with the breakdown of the authority of the Workers' Party of Korea, as well as the breakdown of the command economy and the collapse of food production and distribution. At the micro level, short-term trigger events in the form of external or internal shocks lead to rapid institutional degeneration towards state failure in a really short time frame. So these black swan events, as Nassim Nicholas Taleb would call them, these are harder to foresee. In and of themselves, any one of these shocks might not be expected to be catastrophic. But in the context of pre-existing macro and intermediate level weaknesses, they can become the trigger for a state failure cascade. The scholars who predicted North Korea's collapse in the 1990s thought they were witnessing this kind of state failure cascade in process. So if North Korea exhibited all the signs of state decay, why didn't it collapse during the arduous march? Well, this is an important question. Scholars predicting collapse did not foresee the development and the effectiveness of various coping strategies, both by the government and by people on the ground. They didn't see how effective Songun politics would be in stabilising the economy and of solidifying the political system. They also didn't see how grassroots entrepreneurialism would emerge as a survival adaptation for ordinary North Koreans and the buffer that this would provide for the food system and by extension the government. And indeed, survival adaptations are not something that are always predictable beforehand because they emerge as people adjust to the specific needs that they have for survival in that moment. So the lesson here is that fragility doesn't automatically lead to collapse. But this doesn't mean that the DPRK will never collapse, but what it does indicate is that in North Korea, the state and the society are, more, are likely more resilient than they would initially appear which has allowed North Korea to muddle through, as American scholar Marcus Noland called this in 1997. And indeed, the state failure, state fragility concept has been criticised on the grounds that it does overlook local level strengths and responses to crises, and that it discounts local models of governance and social order that might hold the key to maintaining relative stability under extreme stress. So North Korea might yet be able to muddle through for a long time to come. Many of the scholars who predicted North Korea's collapse also argued that the only way that this could be avoided was for North Korea to fully reform its command economy and open it up to foreign capital. And this, they argued, was the only way that North Korea could generate foreign currency to address food insecurity by buying food on international markets. So the model they advocated for was the standard Washington consensus formula, which had been followed during the 1990s by post-Soviet Russia. And the formula, you see the basic tenets written out here on the slide, open the economy to foreign investment, privatize state-owned firms, sell off state assets to private companies, Get rid of any laws that might restrict the movement of capital. Accept crippling development loans from the World Bank and IMF, etc., etc. 
So this would have essentially handed control of the economy and by extension de facto political control to external actors outside of North Korea. So in effect, voluntary regime change if the government had signed up to this. But from Kim Jong-il's perspective, he didn't see the path forward in terms of such a stark binary choice between opening or collapse. So this is the context of Songun politics, which was essentially Kim Jong-il rejecting that binary choice between opening and collapse, and instead choosing a third option that could maintain his regime, albeit in a weakened form. Even so, the DPRK state of old had been weakened to such an extent that trying to preserve the political system and the command economy of the Kim Il-sung era was just not an option. Kim Jong-il did have to make accommodations to the forces of change in order to perpetuate his regime. Now today, while the collapse risk, risk has stabilised to some degree, Kim Jong-un also faces difficult questions about how to perpetuate his rule while adapting his weak state to changing circumstances. The key question is, what degree of managed change is Kim willing to risk? North Korean elites, like those in China, well remember the lesson of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and the dangers of runaway systemic change that can come from attempting economic and political reforms at the same time. So during that time, the Soviet leadership under Mikhail Gorbachev attempted a series of economic and political reforms known as Perestroika and Glasnost. Under the policy of Perestroika, the Soviet leadership undertook to semi-privatise some state-owned enterprises and to liberalise price controls. So they effectively loosened the central planning mechanism of the Soviet command economy, while also beginning to democratise some of the institutions of the state. Perestroika was accompanied by the policy of Glasnost, which allowed for greater freedom of speech, which Gorbachev hoped would help facilitate the implementation of the political reforms of perestroika. However, these reforms didn't go as planned. The opening for freedom of speech opened an avalanche of public criticism of the gross inefficiencies and the criminality of the Soviet state. Just as the political and economic reforms of perestroika were starting to undermine the centralised control of the government, so together, that eroded public confidence in the state. There was too much change all at once, which the political and economic system was unable to accommodate without fracturing, couldn't deal with it without breaking. So this is what opened the space for protest and rebellion in the USSR's satellite states in Eastern Europe, leading to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and eventually, the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself, not two years later. So this is the cautionary tale of runaway systemic change that makes the North Korean leadership extremely wary of making any kind of reform measures. The Chinese and Vietnamese economic reform models have been suggested as possibilities for North Korea. And these models are noteworthy in that they're purely economic measures and neither includes political liberalisation. Vietnam's Doi Moi economic reforms, initiated in 1986, focused on attracting foreign direct investment. It included gradual domestic market liberalisation and reducing government subsidies to state-owned enterprises. China's economic reforms, initiated by paramount leader Deng Xiaoping in the early 1980s, began with gradual market reforms in the agricultural sector, then expanded to the removing of government support for state-owned enterprises. And indeed, many SOEs were allowed to go under if they couldn't operate to budget. But the jewel in the crown of Deng Xiaoping's reforms were China's special economic zones. So this map documents China's special economic zones, which were pioneered by, by Deng through the 1980s and then added to under his successor, Jiang Zemin. Notice the location of most of the major economic zones here on the coast. And they're located here as production and logistics hubs to facilitate the export of 
Chinese goods to international markets. Special economic zones also allowed the limiting of foreign direct investment to specific locations. So that effectively quarantined the risk of political contagion of economic change from spreading to the broader society. North Korea, for its part, has adopted the special economic zones model as the primary vehicle for its economic modernization strategy, particularly also since Kim Jong-un assumed the leadership. Now, Kim Jong-il, for his part, was amenable to making some piecemeal changes. He did have to adjust to changing conditions. So with the risk of state failure stabilised under Songun politics, Kim was able to make some small adjustments to economic management. For example, in 2002, the North Korean government implemented a price reform where state-owned enterprises began paying market prices for the resources they used as inputs while the price of merchandise in state-owned stores was adjusted to reflect the price of these goods that were being sold on the market in the Jungmudan. Farmers were also allowed to increase the size of their private plots and to lease state-owned land for private cultivation, from which farmers could sell any surplus harvest. In 2012, in one of his first economic policies after becoming leader, Kim Jong-un implemented a new quota system in the agricultural sector, which was known as the 628 policy, in which farmers were entitled to keep or sell 30% of their annual harvest. So these are the farmers working on the collective farms. Now, these might seem like extremely small changes to the system, but in the context of how the command system works, this is actually quite a big concession, even though it's very piecemeal. You'll also notice from these measures that the government was trying to squeeze extra production out of farmers and state-owned enterprises by providing a small material incentive to farmers and workers within the context of the command system. So these measures did not attempt to reform the command system itself, they're just trying to squeeze more out of it. They're also intended to stem the emergence of the entrepreneurial economy and restore centralized control back to the state after the famine. But as we've seen previously, this was a goal that we know was unsuccessful. So this is what muddling through looks like. Piecemeal minor adjustments to keep the existing system chugging along. The Kim regime is not going to fundamentally change the structure of the economy if this means compromising its centralized political power. So in this context, special economic zones can be incorporated into the existing system, but further economic liberalization can't. If the Kim regime is unwilling to change, then what are the chances of a popular uprising or a revolt from below? As we've explored in previous videos, North Korea's political system and social controls are explicitly designed to psychologically isolate individuals from each other, to prevent collective action outside of officially sanctioned activities, and to ensure people's devotion to the leader. But, this doesn't mean that there's an absence of discontent among the general population. So in assessing the possibilities for popular uprising, we're looking for a couple of things. A, is there evidence of unrest and agitation against the government? And B, is there evidence of possibilities for collective action and resistance? Let's flesh this out. Rebellions and revolutions always look obvious in hindsight, but it's usually not easy to predict them before they happen. There's no straightforward way to explain exactly what causes a complex event like a rebellion or a revolution, because there's always many variables that coalesce to produce a given event at a given time. But we can try and make sense of this. So we're gonna draw inspiration from J.L. Mackey's famous Inus condition. And using this, we can try and identify the necessary conditions that must be present for a rebellion to take place and the sufficient conditions, which are the immediate triggers that kick off rebellions in the moment. For example, 
Take a look here at the chart on the slide, which documents the political, economic and social causes of the Enlightenment era revolutions in Europe and the Americas. You'll notice that in each category, there's long and medium term trends that created combustible environments for unrest. So these are the necessary conditions. And then there's the immediate trigger events that provided the spark for rebellions to ignite. And these are the sufficient conditions. You'll also notice that J.L. Mackey's necessary and sufficient conditions are kind of similar to David Carment's macro, intermediate and micro level processes of state decay. And you'd be correct to notice this. So both of these are tools to help us evaluate complex non-linear causation of momentous political events. Possibilities for a people power uprising in North Korea came into sharp focus in the immediate aftermath of the Arab Spring revolutions in the Middle East of 2011. Many scholars began to ask if rebellion and revolution can happen in the authoritarian regimes of the Middle East, could it happen in the DPRK? So with that in mind, a comparison between North Korea of today and Egypt during the Arab Spring is a useful way of demonstrating why the possibilities for rebellion in North Korea may be more remote than what we saw in the Middle East. Let's start by comparing some of the necessary causes of the Arab Spring in Egypt with the current situation in North Korea. And I've compiled this list of causes from a number of different studies of the Arab Spring. So this is a bit of a, a hybrid model. In Egypt, the Arab Spring rebellion against the regime of Hosni Mubarak, who's pictured here on the top left, was preceded by over a decade of successively escalating and nationally coordinated protests prior to 2011. Now, in comparison, while there is evidence of occasional localized unrest in North Korea, you can see some of these incidents illustrated in the table on the right here. There's been no protest movement against the North Korean government. There's no rising political pressure cooker that appears to be coming to a head. Those escalating protests in Egypt were enabled by an influential public sphere, a vibrant civil society that was beyond the control of the Mubarak regime. And this provided space for organized political debate and non-state social organization. So if you like, this is the social infrastructure of the 2011 revolution. But by contrast, there's no civil society space for organized political debate in the DPRK. Its social controls are designed to atomize people and to prevent them from organizing collectively. Therefore, that social infrastructure that existed in Egypt is non-existent in North Korea. So the infrastructure for organized rebellion just isn't there. Economic transformation also played a role in creating ripe conditions for revolution in Egypt. The Egyptian middle class had been hollowed out by the Mubarak regime's neoliberal economic policies, which broadly conformed to the Washington consensus model that I described earlier. And this had some interesting impacts. So it left a sizable number of highly educated people unemployed. And these people were angry at losing stable employment and losing their social position. Egypt also had a youth demographic explosion, which further complicated the picture. So the contracting economy was unable to deliver enough jobs to all of these young people, leaving them angry and disaffected too. And this is important because in other cases of revolution across the 20th century, it's been an aggrieved middle class that have become a hotbed of unrest when their social position has been eroded. Now, the DPRK has also undergone economic transformation, as we know, but it's an economic transformation of a different kind. We have seen the emergence of a new middle class, the Donju. And that's the story of the economic transformation in North Korea on the back of the marketization of the economy since the arduous march. So there's trends to watch for here. Liberal democratic theorists might argue that 
as the Dunju become more numerous and more wealthy, they'll start to press for political representation in the future, a greater role in the governance of the state. There's another option though, their potential agitation could flower should their newfound position be undermined by shock events or government policy. So there's a couple of different directions that the politicization of the Dunju class might follow. North Korea also doesn't have the same demographic profile as Egypt. So while Egypt has that huge youth demographic, the famine in North Korea eliminated any demographic pressure. So it's not the same demographic profile. Connections to the global economy were an important variable in the Egyptian case. Egypt was highly exposed to the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And this exacerbated the pain of neoliberal economic reforms for many sections of Egyptian society. At the same time, the Mubarak family and their cronies were getting rich through the privatization of state assets and through corruption. So economic crisis in the context of inequality and unemployment and state corruption thus became a lightning rod for, for widespread grievance. Now, if we look at the North Korean case, yes, the Kim family and their supporters within the regime elite are also living large at the expense of the rest of the population. What's different is that North Korea is largely shielded from fluctuations in the global capitalist market because it's largely disconnected from it. People are used to living with privation. However, the COVID related border closures since 2020 have provided a new economic shock that has put ordinary North Kore Koreans under added duress. So just because people are used to living pri with privation in the past, doesn't mean they're going to put up with that in the context of this new shock. So watch this space. External political influence played a role in the Egyptian revolution. Egyptian politics was influenced by competing interests from great powers and neighboring states, all of whom were acting through proxy actors within Egyptian politics. This is not uncommon for across a number of countries, by the way. In North Korea, conversely, external powers are not able to meddle directly in the internal politics of North Korea. Obviously, neighboring powers do have an interest in North Korean politics, but the structure of the Kim regime and the lack of civil society makes it extremely difficult for external powers to infiltrate domestic politics. And while there's many anti-regime North Korean emigre groups in South Korea and the United States, they lack any tangible influence on politics within the DPRK. So this means that outside forces are not able to play a destabilizing role in North Korea in the way that they did in Egypt in the lead up to the Arab Spring Revolution. Let's now switch our focus to the sufficient causes of the Egyptian revolt and compare with the North Korean case. The Arab Spring revolts across the Middle East was sparked by the self-immolation of a fruit vendor in Tunisia, Mohamed Bouzizi. Bouzizi's act of desperation resonated with millions of people across the region, including in Egypt, who shared similar kinds of grievances with their governments. So this explosion from a single act, this is known as the contagion effect, where an action or event in one place sparks a broader uprising in other locations. The Arab Spring protest contagion was also facilitated by social media technologies, where Facebook and Twitter were used by protesters to mobilize quickly and to circumvent state control measures. And this is particularly on the streets during the protests. These were a really, proved to be a really effective mobilization tool. For its part, the North Korean government has been perpetually concerned about protest contagion, hence its strict controls on flows of information, controls on people movement and collective organization. Also, the information technology infrastructure in North Korea is much, much more limited. As is who gets access to that IT network. 
So this makes the possibilities for protest contagion much more limited in North Korea than they are elsewhere. Also critical as a sufficient condition for the Arab Spring in Egypt was a significant spike in food prices. And you can see this food spike clearly illustrated in the graph here. Imagine the impact of rising food prices and inflation in combination with the widespread unemployment and the widespread grievances against the government. So this was the immediate subsistence grievance that stoked the fire of the revolt. Food insecurity and vulnerability to food price spikes is a commonality that the Egyptian case shares with North Korea, which as we know is in permanent food deficit. So in the North, the 2009 currency devaluation came closest to mimicking this food price shock in North Korea. And we can see another food price shock emerging now in the context of COVID border restrictions and their impact on food availability in the Jungmadang. Today, the COVID border closures, along with the repeated typhoon flood damage of the last couple of years, have combined to create the most serious food shock in North Korea since the arduous march. But what's different is that the food price shocks in North Korea have occurred in a very different context to Egypt. The different necessary conditions are not necessarily there in the DPRK that could see a food price shock lead directly to widespread anti-regime unrest in the same way as it did in Egypt. So my view is that the Egypt-North Korea comparison clearly shows why popular uprising is much less likely in the DPRK. The political environment for popular collective action is just not there. And the Kim regime is very attentive to making sure that this remains the case. So on that basis, I would suggest that state failure is perhaps a more likely possibility than popular uprising or organized revolt. However, I am keeping an eye on the ongoing marketization of the economy and the social forces that marketization is unleashing, because that's changing the relationship between the people and the state. So as Andre Lankov has argued, entrepreneurial business activity creates webs of relationships between people that aren't there in a pure command economy. Entrepreneurs running businesses necessarily have to establish ongoing relationships with both suppliers and consumers. So this creates a network of interpersonal relationships outside of those that are officially sanctioned by the state. The political implications of this new web of relationships is an ongoing story, and that's one I'll be keeping a close eye on. The key moment in the Arab Spring Revolt in Egypt was when the military withdrew its support for the Mubarak regime. And that effectively sealed the fate of Hosni Mubarak and ensured the initial victory of the protest movement. Without that defection of the military, the protests would ultimately not have been successful. Elites always want to be on the winning side to maintain their privileged social position and political power. And they will switch allegiance if they come to see the incumbent regime as unviable and a threat to their position. Up to this time in the DPRK, there's been no evidence of a dissident political or military elite that has been prepared to lead a rebellion against the Kims. However, the active coup-proofing strategies of the leadership are strong proof that the leaders do see risks in a faction of the elite changing sides. Kim Jong-il and now Kim Jong-un have adopted a number of strategies to reduce that coup risk, to reduce their risk of losing power through an elite defection. So, for example, they divide and conquer the elite. They play off key officials in the military and party against one another. And also they play off and generate competition between the institutions of the state. So this minimizes the risk of collusion against the leadership because key figures and key institutions are always competing against each other. They also buy off the elites. They provide goodies to the elites that weds their material interests to that of the regime. So this is where the court economy comes into play. 
And as we've seen in previous videos, North Korea has an extensive coercive apparatus. So this prevents political dissent and sets an example to others of the consequence of consequences of dissent. People are atomized through social organization. So this reduces trust in people's relationships with each other and makes their relationship with the state their most important bond. They foster socioeconomic dependence on the state. So this is where the centralization of the distribution of food and consumables and energy comes into play. Although obviously this one's been quite eroded over the last 20 years. The government's information restrictions attempt to minimize the demonstration effect of political trends from abroad. And it makes it harder for people to mobilize with each other within the DPRK. Official propaganda positions the US and South Korea as the enemy to minimize the influence of emigre groups in those countries impacting on North Korean politics. And then there's this idea of fortress DPRK, of heavily restricting the entry and movement of foreigners to help maintain ideological purity and minimize espionage and covert actions by foreign nationals. So integrated together, all of these measures significantly reduce the risk of a coup d'etat against Kim Jong-un. So under what conditions might a coup d'etat occur? One scenario is the Egypt scenario, where regime perpetuation becomes unviable in the face of a committed widespread popular uprising. But as I've just discussed in the previous section, this popular uprising scenario is unlikely. Another scenario that might get traction in the context of North Korea's political system is that elites might choose to switch allegiance in order to preserve their privileged positions, but under a different leadership, if they as a group begin to feel unsafe under Kim Jong-un. We know Kim Jong-un undertakes periodic purges uh, of elites throughout the structure of the state. Now, this could be interpreted as an attempt to diminish the security of the elites if these purges become too frequent and too indiscriminate. So that could trigger key elites to organize together and move against Kim for their own survival motives. And here, in particular, key military figures would be pivotal in this scenario because controlling the military is the key to controlling the state. Remember the Egypt example. Another scenario might arise in the context of leadership succession. The transition from one leader to another in authoritarian political systems is a notoriously fragile time. An incoming leader needs to have the support of key sections of the elite, including key figures within the military and the party, in order to ensure a stable succession. And this was the question of many North Korea watchers that we had in 2011 after the Kim Jong-il's death. And we were wondering whether this young boy, Kim Jong-un, had the necessary backing among elites to legitimize his leadership. Now, obviously, Kim Jong-un has since solidified his grip on power. However, should he die suddenly without a clearly anointed successor, then the possibilities for factional infighting become more immediate. It's important to point out that leadership change via a coup d'etat does not necessarily alter the political and economic system. The norms and rules and procedures governing the state's political and economic activities can remain the same, but just under new management. That new leadership after a coup might still be centralized around one powerful person, or it could change to a collective leadership of key elites, like what we see with the military hunter in Myanmar. What about regime change imposed from outside the DPRK? Well, if we rewind back to 2002, and we'll recall US President George W. Bush's post 9-11 axis of evil speech, and it looked like North Korea might follow Iraq as a target of an American war of regime change. So you remember, I distinctly remember President Bush saying, Iraq, Iran and North Korea constitute an axis of evil. But this wasn't the most serious escalation between the US and North Korea since the Korean War armistice. 
During the first nuclear crisis in 1994, US President Bill Clinton seriously considered bombing North Korea to destroy its nuclear reactor site at Yongbyon. Then in 2017, President Donald Trump published a series of inflammatory tweets threatening North Korea with war in the wake of the DPRK's sixth nuclear test. And Trump followed this up by sending three aircraft carrier groups to the waters of Northeast Asia in a clear message to Kim Jong-un. In all of these cases, war was avoided. The US military brass provided consistent advice to the sitting president of the day that even a limited attack on North Korea was likely to escalate into a full-scale war that would be disastrous for the region. Check out this nighttime satellite composite photo of the Korean Peninsula. And this tells you everything you need to know about why attacking North Korea is a bad idea. Just look slightly south of the DMZ. The Seoul metropolitan area is clearly visible as that big glowing orb. It's only 40 kilometers south of the DMZ. Seoul is not defensible from North Korean artillery and missile attack. The government and the economy of South Korea is heavily centralized in Seoul, not to mention the 25.6 million people who live in the greater Seoul area. Any attack on Seoul would be catastrophic for South Korea because of all these reasons. So the US and South Korea are unlikely to consider any kind of military action against the DPRK, and even that includes limited airstrikes. Because of this high possibility that any attack, however small, will escalate to full-scale war and expose Seoul to North Korean retaliation. Even though the US and South Korea would inevitably win a war with the North, the risk of casualties and damage is far too high. Externally imposed regime change is therefore unlikely in the absence of some other shock event that necessitated intervention. What about Beijing? Could the Chinese be interested in regime change in the DPRK? Well, this is interesting. Kim Jong-un had his brother Kim Jong-nam assassinated in response to rumors that Kim Jong-nam was being groomed as Beijing's puppet-in-waiting to rule North Korea. If this was to happen, it could possibly take place through a coup of North Korean elites with covert Chinese backing. More likely, a Chinese puppet ruler could be a Chinese contingency for a post-Kim North Korea following a state collapse. There's almost no chance China would go to war to remove the Kim regime because it just doesn't serve China's broader strategic interests of maintaining stability in the Korean Peninsula and preserving North Korea as a buffer zone against American forces. Why does the longevity of the Kim regime and the future of North Korea matter so much for regional states? Well, for one, there's an interesting material incentive. North Korea is one of the few places on earth that's virgin territory for global capitalism. It's resource rich, and it's got extensive needs for infrastructure development. Now, in this regard, the summits of 2018 and 2019 that involved the two Koreas and the US, as well as separate North Korean leaders meetings with China and Russia, were all illustrative in how the regional states surrounding North Korea were positioning themselves to take advantage of the potential political thaw and opening of the DPRK to inject foreign direct investment, to get involved in this resource extraction and infrastructure development. But beyond that, obviously, contingency planning is really important for regional states. How should their governments respond in the event of state collapse and or the fall of Kim Jong-un? These are seismic change in the region. And what might be the military, political and economic implications of this kind of level of event? It's already well understood that state collapse and or war will create a colossal humanitarian crisis and precipitate the exodus of hundreds of thousands of refugees, most of whom will have to flee through China and many of whom will try to end up in South Korea.
Now, neither China nor South Korea or any other regional states want to have to accommodate that number of North Korean refugees. And on top of that humanitarian problem, you know, one contingency of critical importance to global security would be securing North Korea's nuclear weapons stockpile and nuclear technologies in the event of state collapse. So think about it. In the absence of the functioning institutional governance and oversight of the state, nuclear sites could be vulnerable to being stripped of parts and sold to actors outside of the DPRK. So obviously there's all the people that work there would be out of a job, where are they going to eat, how are they going to survive, and this is something we've seen in the past in failed states where uh, industrial infrastructure gets stripped so people can sell off those parts and make a living when there's not other options available. Now, it's not necessarily just the nuclear weapons themselves that are an issue here, but there's also fissionable material. So that's the stockpiles of uranium and plutonium and related nuclear technologies. Without active monitoring, nuclear sites could also be at risk of breakdown. So this is especially relevant to the nuclear reactors at Yongbyon. All regional states have an interest in securing the safety and integrity of the nuclear program in this scenario. However, what's interesting is who gets there first could become another flashpoint for competition between regional powers. On the balance of probabilities, my view is that the risk of great power war in Korea is probably greatest in the aftermath of state collapse in the DPRK. Now, we shouldn't assume that South Korea will automatically inherit the North into a unified Korea in this scenario. You can imagine both Chinese and American and South Korean forces scrambling to enter into North Korea and occupy this collapsed space to forestall the worst consequences of the security vacuum and humanitarian catastrophe. But that would also bring these competing armies into direct contact with each other, which we haven't seen in Korea since the Korean War. So overall, I think what this shows is that despite North Korea's nuclear weapons program and despite its government's horrible human rights abuses, the incentives for regional states to remove Kim Jong-un by force are actually far outweighed by the risks of what could happen if all that goes wrong. I'll conclude with some quick generalizable lessons from this topic. So first, scenario mapping is much better than making definitive predictions. And you'll notice this in the language that I use. I'm talking the language of probability and risk rather than this is definitely gonna happen. Also, all scenarios for systemic change in any context, whether that change is internally managed, externally imposed, or some kind of implosion, always carry significant risks. And the rewards of pushing for systemic change don't always justify the risk. So as the risk of escalation to war in Korea illustrates, it is actually possible to make a bad situation even worse through rash action. And as usual, here's my summary of key points for your assignment revisions. And don't hesitate to add your own observations to this chart. I'm awesome.